do the housing action plan? Yep. So this housing action plan kind of builds nicely on the items that we just focus on. Uh, housing has been a responsibility <coughs> for the ABAC for, for a long while, but as you all know, with SB 375, those responsibilities only increase uh, beyond RENA, beyond cooperation on small projects. On top of that, the challenges that we're facing today, not that the housing crisis is new to the Bay Area, but the challenges that we're facing today are much more intense. So what we have heard from you, from the executive board, from the regional planning committee, and through the public workshops, is that we're doing great planning, but we, you want to see changes on the ground. We need to scale up the effort. We need to step into tasks that actually bring the resources that we have been losing, that we actually help the cities produce the housing that we have not been building, and on top of that, facilitate uh, new options, new possibilities, whether it's accessory units or, or junior apartments, there's a wide gamut of possibilities that we're exploring. So it's in that light that we put together the housing action agenda. We had that discussion um, at the executive board. So what we were hoping, since the time is, is really tight, we were hoping that we can drill on some of, on some of the specifics to get uh, more of your input. The task here is, and Dwayne is carrying a lot of this knowledge and coordination, but the task, the heavy task is going to be, can we build enough consensus on putting the funding together and on the uses of the uh, Regional Housing Trust Fund? And so that's the, that's the input that we really need from you at this meeting. Dwayne, do you want to take Yeah, thanks. So. We've all had a long day. <laughs> I, I, I've noticed this is the nearly the last item between you and the door. Um, so um, let me let me do it this way. Let, let me uh, say where we're going. Take a short lap through the memo, a really short lap, and then come right back to what what we'd like. Um, at the at the end of the short staff report, there there's a set of questions. Um, obviously, ask me anything you want about this, but really what it comes down to is we're about to jump off on two to three dozen focused interviews of people who over the last two years have indicated a really high level of interest for ABAG taking some leadership around Regional Housing Trust Fund. And, you know, we've had casual conversations. We really want to jump into it, be focused, be disciplined, and, and move right through it. Before taking that step, we want to make sure that there's a, a strong level of board buy-in, and that um, you know there, there's a dozen subordinate questions. But on the on the main features of it, what are we talking about? We'd like to see if, you know if we're headed in the right direction. And so that's the set of questions there um, at at the end. A few key features that um, we're focused on. Um, there's lots of suggestions for, oh, if we had such a fund, where would we focus the uses? And, oh, if we had to find that much money, where would we find it? Um, and obviously, we can't, we can't do everything first, so we'd like to get some guidance on both of those. And then finally, this is really the, the big focus uh, of the task, is um, th we really need to develop a political constituency. Um, we believe it's out there. You hear it all the time but we need a, a focused uh, agenda to, to move that forward. So, um, as I promised, very briefly, I'll just run through the, the memo. There's a set of basics in here, and I um, just want to touch on them really quickly. Um, first of all, what is a housing trust fund? Um, there's a lot of different ways to cut it, but it really comes down to it's a restricted fund that has a dedicated use or set of uses. It has a dedicated source. It has some public oversight and governance. Um, and, um, you know, well, it, it's limited to a particular geography, typically. Um, 
that's all it is. That's pretty generic. On that set of definitions, there's, by my count, somewhere at least 75 of them in the Bay Area. What they tend to be is very city-focused or sub-regionally focused. They tend to be focused on one particular thing, the, the Workforce Proximity Housing Fund, for example, is by the definition a housing trust fund. It's just geographically focused and it's topically focused. It does have a dedicated revenue source. That's the big deal. Um, so. In terms of uses, it's wide open. You can use it for anything. But um, I listed in the packet some of the ones that we hear about most often. Um, acquisition rehab. The, uh, this is, uh, for instance, the, the, the so-called NOAA fund, the Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing Fund that uh, MTC is putting together the, as a follow-on to the, to the TOD fund is um, qualifies as, as this on this focus. Uh, we hear not as often, but um, forcefully when we hear it, that there's a need for mobile home park preservation in some communities. Um, it's a form of home ownership, low income home ownership, that is always fairly perilous because frankly often it's a land banking opportunity for the landlords who, who have it. Um, we're doing a big push on integrated retrofits that would bring seismic upgrades and energy conservation, water conservation, and affordability to particular projects. There's a lot of good pilots around the Bay Area, but there's nothing that, that's operating at scale. Um, Mark has made us aware at every opportunity of, of the uh, <laughs> high demand. Uh, there were more than 20, uh, all of them a little bit different, none of them as cool as Mark's, but uh, you know, uh, shared appreciation, limited equity, homeowner, you know, middle income homeowner programs. They were funded by RDAs, RDA went away, most of them withered. A lot of them have a trickle of revenue coming back from those loans. They don't have the staff anymore, they don't have the infrastructure to revolve those funds and, and make use of it, let, let alone um, grow it up. Uh, you hear a lot about accessory dwelling units. Um, it's not really clear that the missing ingredient there is really money. However, um, what we hear is that most homeowners have quite a bit of difficulty making the arrangements to pull all that together when they need to uh, because of some banks aren't used to dealing with it and, and you know, questions that you've heard about a lot. So um, a range of popular uses, that's the fun part. Okay. The hard part is where does the money come from? Well, the most fun part of that is um, let's get some private money. Well, private money doesn't require, but is usually uh, much easier to attract uh, or, or to build a fund if there's public money that, that it leverages. That's what the TOA fund is. That's what's being proposed for the NOAA fund. Um, so that's, that's the heavy lifting. Um, there's a variety of interesting proposals out there for how to do it. Um, all of them are either going to require a focused legislative effort at the state level or they're going to require ballot measure work. Um, and I've listed some of those, but we can, we can loop back to that. Lastly, there's sources, there's uses, there's uh, uh, what could be called the mechanics or the organization. There's a lot of subordinate questions and an independent organization. Um, is it, you know, from the ABEG staff, do we contract with existing programs. There's a bunch of ways to approach it, but it's but it's a very important aspect. Again, the, the memo just ticks through a few of those. Um, where the memo ends is it says uh, generally get some board buy-in and start talking to people. Uh, as I said, in, in a focused way to, to start to shape what it is and where we're going. Um, some of you have thought about this a lot and talked to people a lot and have sort of honed some, some opinions and some focus and others of you, of course, I mean, nobody could have not been involved in some conversations about this but have, left, have thought in, in a less focused way about it. So um, I don't want to slight anybody by sort of charging ahead as a result of conversations with, with those of you who have thought about it um, and talked about it more, but I will risk doing that by, if, if for the sake of accelerating this a little bit. 
back to the cover memo. Um, well, I said there's a lot of sources, uses, ways to organize things. There's a few key factors that, as we've heard it, seem like they're they're near definitional. They're they're really really key. Um, one of them is whatever we do, it would be really important to work very closely and have a complementary effort to the existing programs, particularly the municipal programs, and particularly we have some very strong and very successful community development financial institutions, CDFIs in the Bay Area, Low Income Housing Fund, that you would be familiar with, you know, just as one example. Um, the Housing Trust of Santa Clara County, after about eight years of existence, morphed into the Housing Trust of Silicon Valley. And um, they have aspirations on the particular programs that they're focused on to have a Bay Area-wide operation. Along the way, they started out as a 501c3, and while they're still a 501c3, they went through the licensing work and the credentialing work, and frankly took on the regulatory obligations of becoming a community development financial institution. That allows them to do things like uh, take insurance company money or bank money for um, organizations that have some, some federal requirements for Community uh, Reinvestment Act. Um, so there's a lot of good CDFIs. There are a lot of housing trust fund uh, work happening already. So, th so that would be one principle, is that we work closely with those existing programs. A second principle would be, which follows from the first principle, we're not just another mouth to feed um, going to the same sources trying to say, give us some of that money instead of those other organizations. The, the final of sort of the big three that, that I pulled out um, as really salient points were while we could narrow it down and say, and, and there's a lot to be said about a narrow focused effort, let's go for one particular use and one particular source. When we nail that, let's then try to expand and grow it. It's a viable approach. It's, you know, we're leaning in the other direction, which is to be open to and pursue multiple sources, if that's what we hear in, in doing the interviews, and to have, uh, you know, not certainly be willy-nilly, but to have a number of the important uses be, be fundable that people have called out. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there, and then after that, I just, I would really like to get, hear from you about sources and uses, and leave at least half of however much time we have left to focus on, but really, how do we go out and develop the constituency for this and to, to do the heavy work? And so, Can I, I, quick question. Yeah. You, what What is Alameda County doing? They're, they're putting something on the ballot. Do you know, and I think there's a meeting either tonight or tomorrow that we're sending some people to. Yes. What are they doing? Um, so, I hear that most often referred to as the bond. Right. And, and people talk about the bond because that's the result of doing it. Um, it, it's, a, it's a ballot measure uh, to raise a tax to, to develop a revenue stream to begin paying off the bond. And, and they're definitely going to ballot with that. So it's not a new housing trust fund? It's not, not, not anything like it? Um, it's, it's, it's not a new organization. I mean, that money will go into a dedicated fund. And I mean, that's, that's a really key point, because there are in Santa Clara County right now and San Mateo County, though they're trailing, and perhaps trailing far enough that they won't make the ballot, but there are concerted efforts to get um, public, you know, publicly sourced monies to pay off bonds in those three counties. Alameda is definitely going to the okay. ballot with it. Pay off what bonds? I don't... So you can have a... No, for Alameda County. I don't actually know what source they're proposing. That's what I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's new stuff or if it's uh, existing already bonds. Uh, no, it is new stuff. Okay. I'm sorry. So they, want it, they, they want to, they want to float bonds to issue, to issue bonds. Yes. Right. Yeah, okay. Yes. For That's what? what I'm saying. For housing? Affordable housing. It's an affordable, affordable housing, housing project. Yes. For all it's an of our affordable housing, housing fund. Right. Countywide. Yeah. yeah. Countywide. Yeah. They're, obviously, they're working closely with the cities, but it's the county right. that's going to put it on the ballot. 
And the homeowners as well as commercial well, well, properties would pay? Um, I'm not sure if it's a parcel tax. My or understanding it was it was going to be everybody. I think right. it's a parcel tax, right? Okay. Parcel tax is being discussed. Uh, uh, another sliver of sales tax is being discussed. Um, there are at valorum taxes. Those, are, you know, so it's not flat yeah. per parcel. Um, a uh, development impact fee, something per square foot, um, is also being discussed. So, uh, to my knowledge, that hasn't been. Oh, they haven't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They haven't decided. They have to log us before they have to put the measure the actual together. language. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so they're going for November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. November. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so they they're doing some polling. Um, they're, I mean, they're exploring these very questions. Um, the, the way they interact, and we both sort of on principle, obviously, we have to be complementary with local and, and, and county level programs. But beyond principle, just as a as a dollar and cents issue, if if particular cities or counties have fees and taxes in place, have have ways of raising dedicated sources. Um, we're going to have to have a very compelling story indeed or a design relationship that says uh, there's some kind of return to source formula saying, uh, you know, if, if we're asking everybody for five of something and you're already getting ten, well, unless we do a really good job of selling it, we're really not asking you to go to fifteen. We're probably talking to you about how we can work together. Wait, what, yeah, what percentage of those bonds, for instance, are uh, the overall cost of, a, of any given project? Mm -hmm. Do we have any information about that? So, I mean, what, what are we trying to, how much are we leveraging those dollars? Yeah. Um, well, of course, any of the affordable housing developers will tell you they're happy to have that slice be as large as it possibly can be. Um, on average, um, it's in the... 30 to 50 percent range. I use 40 percent as a rule of thumb. It varies widely project to project, but, but this would be, and, and I'm, I'm shorthanding here, this would be if you set aside money raised from tax credits, money that can be supported from rent, um, long-term debt that you might get, sort of what what's the what's public, public piece, the, the gap, the so-called <coughs> gap. Um, uh, and another way of thinking it is typically RDA sort of average across the Bay Area. That was around the amount that was going in from RDA was around that 40% number. Okay, thank you. So, My thought on... Hold on one second, Mark. Oh. Pat's been trying to get in. Well, that's okay. Just a couple of questions. The TOA fund, I, I don't understand what the difference is between the TOA fund and this regional housing trust fund. Um, the TOA fund uh, apparently... Uh, MTC had some money that they put into a fund to sort of be the yeah. initial investment pool, the way I understood that mm -hmm. the fund used is used. But if you could answer those questions, then I have some other questions. Yeah, on the so let me answer that. And, and Brad has been really involved with the TOA as well. So, um, you know, so what, what jump is the in difference? if I miss another bit. And why so, do we need this one versus why couldn't we just use yeah, the TOA fund? So it's not, it's not versus. I'll, I'll say some of the distinctions. TOA is, the purpose is narrowly focused, whereas this could be for multiple uses, although we could decide to have it be narrowly focused. It is a fund that was, uh, there was some public money, MTC, one time MTC grant that was put in, and then investment money was layered on top of that. All of the other money that was put in were investments. There weren't. They weren't grants. They they weren't long time investments months. from whom? From insurance companies. Well, they were from community development financial institutions, which are in the business of aggregating social impact investors, the banks, insurance company money. Typically, instead of typically, they will want a return on investment that is more patient, meaning long, longer term, and at a lower interest rate than an open market investment, but. It's still not free money. But this is for um, affordable housing. Yes. And so what it did is it bought down the interest rate? It, um, it, it allowed, yeah, it, 
so there's a, a blended stack of funds where the 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 largest ones that are at the least risk have there's there's a different amount of the different interest rates and different level of risks and it's anchored at the bottom by public money that is most at risk and is either free or has the lower lowest interest rate that could be done with that 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 could be done with the money raised in a regional housing trust fund as well the key is we're looking for a dedicated long-term revenue stream that. rather than a one-time pop right I would say that's the key distinction. Let, the other thing me, to remember is yeah, that the, the, um, friend, and then let's go to Mark for the total money was ten million dollars twice right. for the whole oh, region. Ten, okay. And they had a maximum of I think two million dollars per project. So there was a project in the tender one they funded mm -hmm. that had a twenty five million dollar funding gap. So giving them two million dollars didn't get them into construction. Mm -hmm. They gave that money three years ago. And it's only now that the developers put twenty more million in that that project go forward. So it's mostly for new construction gap financing, and it's only a relatively small amount of money one time for the whole region. The housing trust fund would ideally be a yearly source, an annual source of money, so it go every year and be larger in the aggregate for the whole region than $10 million. And, well, I was, I was going to get some in. That's, that's great. If you don't get your questions. No, I got a program. So, <laughs> <laughs> Drum roll, so please. My, my thoughts <laughs> on why it should probably be a work proximity like program is because of the administration. I mean, one is it's very easy to administer the job of a bag or whoever would administer it, would essentially be to be sure that uh, they were the income range that you wanted. You don't have to qualify them for a loan, the banks do that. And that, you know, that they understood the rules where they could buy a home or whatever. Uh, you could distribute it throughout the region so you don't have all this money going to one spot and people feeling like they got left out. I mean, basically, you could make it available to people to buy homes throughout the region. You could target particularly, you know, areas that are most likely to suffer displacement or whatever to, to do. Um, and the money doesn't go away. It, it grows so you put five million bucks in it and you have five million dollars in assets that tend to grow and ultimately replenish themselves as those loans get paid back so it's not you create ultimately a self-sustaining revenue pot unless the market really goes south again or something but um, so it's just uh, it seems like it'd be very healthy from a regional perspective easy to administer distributes the opportunities throughout the region um, make a meaningful difference in that area to go much beyond that I'm thinking like you know as you get involved in a particular project then you need to have staff to make sure that mm -hmm. you know the projects being administered mm -hmm. the way it's supposed to be administered you get into either you're you're either into construction or you're into property management or you're into something <coughs> which ultimately means a whole bunch more staff and a bunch of new concerns um, so that's so I don't know if you need me to do that, but there it is. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I agree with Mark um, because you could then uh, convince the Strategic Growth Council, as you, what the staff report is recommending, to put some one-time money into this fund, which could over time grow. Um, but the proposal to do a ballot measure for a regional development impact fee or a document recording fee, um, I have some real significant problems with. Um, so, you know. I don't know that you need to do that. No, I, I, I have a big no on this thing because I, I think you can get a there's a problem with that. Start getting private input into it pretty easily. I mean, bankers, realtors. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, look. So we've got about two and a half million dollars in our program. If you did an assessed value, it's probably worth three and a half million dollars. But you figure um, probably at least a million dollars went to realtor commissions. I mean, you know, when it's all said and done. And so there's people who have an interest in making this thing happen that you, we could talk to and encourage to. Uh, so, and I might, I might have missed the details before, but so have, have you had substantial contributions to that fund so far? Ours was all developer fees. Ours was our affordable housing trust fund uh, developer fees. So we haven't had any outside contributions to our fund. Um, but it just seems like the kind of thing that 
Well, if you just get a one-time yeah. contribution from the state, you've got a lot of seed money that you could work on for about the next five years before That's you're right. actually saturated. It doesn't, you know, these loans don't just go out like that. They, they take time before people realize they're there. And it, it took us like two years before we had the first 25 loans. And so um, it just, it, it, it won't happen overnight. But in the meantime, you're learning the process, you're learning how to get things done and, and uh, you're developing that skill and hopefully the reputation and, and ultimately you can build on it. Well, and realistically, the banks have a big interest too because yeah. they're making money on every one of those mortgages that they write. And so there's no reason that they shouldn't be approached to say, give us some of that money back in the form of regular donations back into the trust fund as part of your co community development investment requirement. And so you've got banks, you've got corporations who are looking to house their own employees, you approach them for contributions, the realtors organizations, you can you ask them. builders, these are the guys <clears> that are going to be buying the <throat> middle income housing when it ever gets built. So. Exactly. And so there's, there's a lot of folks. and. I even talked to, I think I've mentioned this several times before, but one of the major venture capitalists in Silicon Valley approached me after I was talking to the Economic Institute one day, and he said, you know, there's a place in a deal like that for us to invest money and get some return on it, uh, share the return, and it occurred to me that maybe that's the kind of a source you use for your acquisition rehab. Or something that's a, something that's a little more long-term kind of an investment, but there've got to be other sources as well, and and you want to set it up so it's not in competition with what anybody else is doing. Right. So it's a complementary thing. But in the in terms of the kind of a program that they're doing in Napa, when you can put in 10 percent instead of 40 percent you go a lot further with these dollars, and that's a huge selling point. And the fact that you don't have time deed restrictions, um, you don't have to be there 30 years to pay it off, and, and all of those things, or you don't get any equity out of it, which is what a lot of the long-term agreements used to have. I mean, that was a real disincentive, um, especially when the market fell, um, and they could go out and by market rate for what you know they had and they were able to get for a uh, for a affordable one that came up with all the strings and so the less strings we have on these the more you're giving people a true hand up instead of just a handout Business. and the 40 percent or mm -hmm. more to me is a handout mm -hmm. And it's not really accomplishing what we're trying to do with dollars that are entrusted to us to, to help people get around. Dave? Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I agree with you, but at the same time, the workforce, and as lovely a project that that, that is, that's not the solution for everything, right? That, that's no. one no. tool in the toolbox. Right. So those percentages are gonna vary from sure maybe, maybe tens on the low side, maybe we can keep it to 40. I'm curious about the, uh, uh, just thinking about in my own, line of work and uh, all the developers that I know as well. In terms of the acquisition rehab, has that been, uh, have we kind of planted ourselves in a place where the uh, real motivation for those developers are within all new construction? Uh, and that's why, uh, from a financial standpoint, they go in that direction as opposed to rehabbing the existing building? Is it the difference between what would be considered raw land, which of course in the city is non-existent anyway, uh, versus a, uh, you know, the, the cost of a rehab. Uh, is that what's keeping us from moving in that path? And what would be yeah. different in this plan, you know, if that is true, yeah. how do we overcome that? Uh, so, so two answers. Um, there's a variety of reasons that it's harder for the, the straight ahead affordable housing, new construction development industry. One big one is that there are two federal tax credit programs. The one that pays higher developer fees and that has some other attractive features called the 9% program is just for new construction. Um, the 4% the, uh, the tax credit program is uh, more challenging to use 
and uh, the projects are often more challenging because you have people living there that uh, need to be relocated temporarily. Uh, you know, so there's a variety of complications. When when things are going well and when there's plenty of tax credits and, and plenty of local GAP money to go around, the large nonprofit affordable housing developers will focus on new construction, and then that adds units, and that all makes sense. As as those monies become less available, they they tend to branch out and do more acquisition rehab. Um, all of the counties and uh, most of the larger cities, so pretty much uh, any of the 33 jurisdictions that are directly getting CDBG money and home money, um, will have some capacity to do acquisition rehab programs and will have done some of them. Uh, so it's the, the question of what, what would be different about this fund, in, in one way, nothing. It's just that if there were a pot of money that could go to the existing programs and say, well, great, you did one last year, what if you could do two? You know, or maybe two in the last five years, what if you could do four? That would be, that would be the, the focus of that. Um, I appreciate that, thank yeah. you. Other thoughts? You've been remarkably quiet today, <laughs> taking lots of notes. I'm just curious about how the other 70, the 75 jurisdictions operate that are local and how a regional um, operates. So San Francisco passed a, I think it's like 50 million a year <coughs> over 10, 10 years for a housing trust fund. And then in 2015, a bond, $310 million bond that splits up public housing to a bunch of other first time home buyers to uh, middle income as well. But, um, yeah. but how would it yeah, operate on a regional level? I'm just curious. Well, you are in an anomalous situation. I mean, most most of the most of the jurisdictions, uh, even the medium-sized ones, have they have dedicated funds, but they're they're fed by existing. Uh, if they have an inclusionary program with in lieu fees, a, a few, but a very few have development impact fees that will trickle into these funds. A challenge that they face is that they they don't. There's only a few projects going through the pipeline, so they, they need the money episodically and in big chunks. It's trickling in. There's no, uh, in, in addition to just being flat out raising the money, which is useful, there's currently no way to pool that money and to, to manage it the way that you would manage a fund where you have money coming in and going out. So. Uh, um, uh, Council member, Mayor, I guess, Garcia in, in American Canyon is is an example of that they're, they're a community that has a, a project that's gone all the way through entitlements. They've, they've weathered, negotiated, figured out the local support package. But it's just waiting for about another million and a half dollars of, of GAP money. Um, he can point to sources that they would have, say, over the next five years, and, and frankly, um, they're unlikely to have another project in the pipeline. I mean, it's, it's not something they do frequently, but it's something that they've worked hard to, to get there. And so if there was a way to get them the money that they needed when they needed it, and to manage that because you were balancing across a lot of funds, that, that would be um, a feature. So in San Francisco, that happens in a conference room in the mayor's office of housing. And they said, well, Mercy, great project. You need to wait till next year. You know, uh, TNDC, let's move ahead this year. And, and they have a lot of tools to work with. So it's kind of a matter of scale. But, but wasn't your question, how would this big regional fund work with all the individual funds scattered throughout the cities and counties? And how would they mesh or not compete with each other? Or Yeah, I was, uh, I, there are several parts of that. I was, I was trying to talk about mesh in terms of the timing of it. Yeah. But so, um, it, to pick another example, the 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 home buyer programs. Um, the I know of five <coughs> existing programs, all of whom would be really happy to have the money revolve in say six months instead of trickle in when the home's sold. So, um, what? 
we had a statewide housing bond, Prop 1C. A piece of that money was set aside for housing trust funds. A number of the housing trust funds have first-time home buyer programs. What you could use the Prop 1C money for was if, so if, if your program made one of those loans and it conformed to the Prop 1C guidelines, they'd give you back half the money. And by the time you'd done two loans, you'd go and so everything positive you said about it revolving and about it uh, growing and so all that, but their, their money was an accelerant. Um, so that's, that's another example. You could leave all of the existing local programs in place. Uh, Silicon Valley uh, Housing Trust Fund, if, if they think that they can take on the whole region and all the places that aren't served by existing local ones, well, they can give that a go. Uh, but if they made loans that conformed, uh, and, and you could put some constraints on it or some incentives to focus on PDAs or not, or you know, whatever, you know, however priorities you wanted to do that. So again, it's kind of a matter of, of mm -hmm. scale for small and medium-sized jurisdictions. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Other comments, questions? Where do we want to go with this? Do we want to go forward with this? What do we want to do? Uh, well, Direction? We know that MTC staff mm -hmm. has expressed a lot of interest in doing this as well. Yeah, so. when I talked to Steve about it some time ago, a couple months ago, he sort of shook his head and went, wow. And so did the Krant. It seems like a natural alliance. Yeah, it does. Um, you would think that one of the first charges would be to do some political analysis, in other words, focus groups and polling, <coughs> to see what would be uh, a consensus approach. Um, probably difficult on the raising revenue side, maybe easier to uh, narrow the list of what would be expenditures that would have very broad consensus. Um, certain provisions would have to be built in, like the non-competition. I don't see that as being difficult. I, I think the larger housing trusts would like to see us do this. Um, they, they would like to regionalize affordable housing. <coughs> so I think the next step really is to talk with MTC about doing a collaborative project, seeing if they'll put some money up to do the uh, political analysis to get some sense whether there's some viability to do it, whether there's any viability to try to raise uh, funds for it, uh, like possibly through a minimum commercial linkage fee, that, where a commercial linkage exists already within a jurisdiction they'd be exempt, but to try to provide more uniformity to commercial linkage, which is a real nexus for this housing piece, um, and whether voters would support that. <coughs> um, and I, I think we need more information before we make any kind of decision. This is a multiple year project. We just need to get started on it if we're going to do it or even think about it. And we may tell you too many red flags, doesn't work. <coughs> um, and as you know, Dave Cortez, he said, you know, these are the kinds of discretionary things that we don't have grants for, so uh, we need a little bit of money, seed money, with, uh, in collaboration with MTC to do it. I know they're very interested in affordable housing. Their total fund is, is tiny in relation to the overall picture, and it's not that collaborative with all the other efforts that are going on in the region. <coughs> Santa Clara has a very robust fund. Dwayne's well, been talking with them. They sounded very excited about us uh, advising us and giving us technical assistance and endorsing us. And we'd have to do that with other uh, the other large funds to, to champion so, the idea of going ahead. So when you're talking about a poll or political analysis or voter support, are you talking about a ballot measure for a bond? Or are you talking about a ballot measure to establish a region-wide uh, commercial linkage fee? Well, I think we need to look at all things. In Seattle, right. voters regularly support small contributions from a variety of different sources to their trust fund. And uh, they have one here that's on hotels, and they have one on documentary fee, and they have one on uh, transfer, and they have one on parcel. And they put them all to a vote, and they, gain, uh, they have consistently gained higher and higher percentages of support, they're now above two thirds, um, and their population has been educated to the fact that more housing in the region is a plus for everybody. 
I don't think we're there yet. I think there's a lot of paranoia about the idea of, of doing something region-wide, uh, paranoia about building new affordable housing where people don't want it, so that we'd have to scratch a lot of things from the expenditure list. I think these, these uh, home ownership type programs are very popular. Um, they certainly address displacement in a way that other programs don't. Um, so I think you'd sort of try to use the political analysis to say, what has a very high percentage of support? And what's, you know, what are the kinds of revenue sources that will definitely not work? You know, what will work at a 50% level? What will work at a two-thirds level? Um, because that's the key to having the trust fund uh, work. It has to have a source of funds. Otherwise, it's not worth going through the whole thing. Then it needs a governance model. That's you know another political discussion among existing housing trusts. We would need the endorsement of that. And then there's the expenditure program, which gets to you know, one of the most popular expenditure programs that don't threaten anybody, but you know have very high levels of, of popularity. Um, so that that was what we would propose with MT to MTC to uh, or anybody else we could think of. But I think doing a, a joint program with MTC would be useful. I trying to help figure out and give us some information to guide us on the next step. Yeah, briefly. I think it would be important <coughs> to do that. I think we need to do a little more research first and get a few more, maybe narrow the scope of what we want to bite off to begin with, identify those potential sources that would not require voter approval first. I mean, things like going to the banks and the big mortgage companies and things like that first, and maybe even some stuff. of the big employers. Talk to the, the Bay Area Council. They are already interested, at least leadership <coughs> is, in exactly this. I've sat down and talked twice with, um, with uh, a lot of their leadership about it. I also think it's probably prudent not to go forward until after June because I just don't think we need a complication on our discussions right now. We don't need one more time for ABAG to go in and say, MTC, we want your money. Could you give us some money? I just don't think that's a really <laughs> well, good idea. Well, why don't you ask Mr. Smear, you read our last. I know, really? Point well, taken, I, but it was intended to be No, 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 no I understand. No, I get that, I get that, and I think that's fine, <coughs> and I think we can get some money into it, especially since I know that some of the MTC staff are very supportive of this sort of concept, um, but I think we need to make sure that when we broach this, we are at our political best, not in a vulnerable position, or looking like we're going with, you know, a handout. We want to we wanna be hand in hand, not begging, um, because I think we can put together a solid program. We can outline a lot of things and then let's plan for some time maybe in July to sit down together and talk about it in a joint meeting of some kind. I would just add that besides the list of people you talk about, the banks and you know, what are, joint venture Silicon Valley should probably be at the oh, table because yeah. they're, you know, they, they, they have a lot of the people down in the valley and their exactly. housing is a huge issue and I think they could bring some support to the issue. And as much as the Bay Area Council and uh, Silicon no, yeah, Valley absolutely. don't very well talk to each other, this it would be, be the a one place thing to bring where we could yeah. get them to agree on one thing. None of us have enough housing. Maybe you could have a regional uh, Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I may agree. not be very far-fetched. Yeah. <laughs> and I agree with Julie. I, I'm not supportive right now of doing any political analysis or polling on uh, what's the voters' threshold for uh, taxing themselves for affordable housing in the Bay Area. Um, or some of the other things that are in here, trying to get pr uh, projects permitted uh, and built, it's sort of like, okay, well, the regional agency is going against the local folks. Um, I just, I don't support that at all, but the concept about going to the Strategic Growth Council, I think is a great idea. And getting some seed money for some of the smaller projects and I, I really like Mark's program. Um, love to see something like that region-wide, you know, for those cities like myself that we don't have any pot of money that we can put aside to do that kind of home ownership program. I really um, do like the regional Airbnb fee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Who it's would a bad oppose idea. that? It's not a bad idea. Yeah. And um, Airbnb. 
a second unit also has come up something that's popular right. to help homeowners go through the process for exactly. second units. Yeah. Wow. So I think I think we got a nugget of something really good here. Did you have something? I was just going to say we we did have a ballot measure process on our ballot. Um, the we it. Airbnb and others <laughs> they funded all these. Um, what do you call them? Bogus. Um, actually, a lot of their um, home sharers groups in everybody's neighborhoods, they would follow me around to the farmer's markets, but almost cult cultish. Really? Um, but they poured in so much money that we were unsuccessful in, in just basic regulation of them and wow. um, requiring just sharing of the information of the home sharers. But, but it was really challenging in just our, our city. But. They can't follow us all around. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> 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 okay, remember Plan Area 2013. Yeah. When we threaten somebody's income, I guess they could. It's a big opposition uh, through that. They're channel. really good at yeah. GPS and things. Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are. So we, I don't think you'd start there. No, no. but I, I think we can start with something that's more manageable, that's not threatening somebody um, what, and their their comfort level. What's probably a little more realistic is, you know, on a larger scale is what you see in like Anaheim and Las Vegas where they have a tourism tax on the, like a hotel or something like that that says, this is, you know, in there it's, it's used money to attract people. It goes to the local convention and visitors bureau. Right. But I mean, it should be more maybe said on a housing thing or a regional housing. I think right. that's probably a, a easier mechanism and sell, I would think, than to, than to target one access. group after one, exactly. Yeah. The easiest possible. And it's the folks who don't live here. Well, yeah, that, that, it's the easiest tax to pass, as you say, <laughs> you're not going to pay it. It's your, you're going to pay it when you don't want your mother-in-law to stay with you and you put her up at a hotel in your city. <laughs> yeah. Which I would gladly admit. We've run into that. We've run into that on the commercial linkage fee. We have one, but there's talk about you know, wineries, for instance, Employ a lot of folks who yeah. aren't making a lot of money. Hotels, uh, oh, right. tourists yeah. serving you know uh, places where the demand is even greater than puts pressure on the housing industry yeah. to have an asymmetrical commercial linkage fee. Yeah. So certain uses that would not have that or, or would have more uh, uh, those lower wage jobs would have a higher fee. So those could I mean that might be something ABAC could do is just summarize what some of these things are in the region so that other communities could tap into yeah. it, see how common they are and like what just we become be a resource yeah. for information yeah. and nothing else. Yeah, we are working on that. Okay. Through our existing planning grant. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Did you get enough direction, Dwayne? Awesome. Too much direction. Awesome. Okay. We're actually now back ahead of schedule. So let's go to public engagement. Can we take a little break because um, Barbara Coase is supposed to come here and I'm not, not, they are not here yet. Okay. And I think it will be very helpful we for you. We haven't had a break all day. That's right. I, for <laughs> lunch. Thank you for lunch. Dublin Iron. I think it's it's break at lunch. Yes, you did. It's a funny story. All right, uh, let's take a break. Uh, what time are they new here? Well, I asked them to be here at 4.30, I'm just, yeah. they were supposed to be here at 5, so I asked them to be here at 4.30, but I haven't received the confirmation. I'll check. Okay. Right. All right. So we're proximity for a grand goes region-wide. Yeah. <laughs> 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 